So uh, welcome to the uh, Young Surgeon Symposium on Business Management. So I'm Jay Turner. I'm going to be moderating. I'm a neurosurgeon from Phoenix. Uh, we have a esteemed panel of speakers that are going to be joining us to um, teach us a little bit about business management. Um, you know, this is a critical topic for you know, our success as spine surgeons, and uh, I think the Solus leadership has correctly identified this as an area that's really uh, undereducated in our training programs. And so uh, you know, I think this is a, we have a broad range of topics being covered, um, but I think it's all uh, very apropos for, for budding surgeons starting their careers. Uh, so we're going to start uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Raj Sethi, who's going to be joining us via the web. Uh, Dr. Sethi is uh, from Virginia Mason. He's the uh, director of the Neuroscience Institute there, and he's uh, you know, really one of the eminent leaders uh, on quality and safety and, uh, and you know, a lot of the uh, financial uh, models that have started to emerge and uh, really has this kind of finger on the pulse of where things are heading. I'm so excited to have Dr. Sethi here. Um, and uh, do we have audio? The, the mic's all yours, Raj. Okay, uh, Jay, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, all right. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, 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 the current state, but really focusing on the future state. So, you know, part, part of what we're doing up here in Seattle is, is we're doing uh, purchaser um, uh, directed healthcare, which is a lot of these large companies now are buying healthcare directly uh, from hospitals and they're taking the middleman out of it. Uh, the reason is, is they insure large numbers of popular, uh, insure large numbers of their own workers, as you know. And, and really what we got to start thinking about is population health, which is the health outcome of a group of individuals. Uh, and the distribution of outcomes within such a group. And as we know, uh, back pain and spinal disorders are a big spend. And so delivering value is, is this quotient, which is the, the outcomes over the costs. And, and, and this is obviously, uh, for those of you that know Michael Porter's work, and, and uh, he, he was one of the guys that kind of brought this to light, this is something that's going to be increasingly talked about uh, as time goes on, particularly because of our, our, our spiraling costs of healthcare. So how do we increase value? Well, there's the idea of quality, there's the idea of outcomes, and then there's the idea of how to pay for it. Um, we right now are still, the vast majority of us are in fee-for-service uh, healthcare scenarios where we get paid for the number of procedures that we do. Uh, some of us get paid by collection, some of us get paid by RVUs, some of us have a mix. But very few American surgeons outside of the traditional HMOs are actually salaried at the current time. Um, uh, and so then we have to start talking about this quantity of care idea. Uh, what are the incentives to treat? What are the resources? And what is the value in the setting of all this? Now there's a new uh, 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 topic that's come up. And obviously, uh, we are doing a lot of work around value-based reimbursement for total joints, for spine care, for, for cardiac care and for bariatric surgery. Now, value-based reimbursement can be split into two areas. There's the idea of bundled payments, and then there's the idea of capitation. Okay, so what is capitation? Capitation is cost per patient per unit time. Risk is spread. Improvement is at a population level. You're choosing the best health systems. You're basically putting health systems against each other as to figure out who can spread this risk the best and who provides the best outcome. Now, the outcome might be a financial one in the, in the case of a large payer like a JetBlue or Walmart or, or, or one of these large companies that wants to control its own costs. It can also be uh, in, in the eyes of the patient uh, when you're in a, at a working age or you're getting back to work. So that, remember, beauty is always in the eye of the beholder. The whole idea about bundles, bundle payment is that it's an entire cycle of care. You get one payment no matter what happens. Um, it is contingent on delivering outcomes, and you're you're carefully adjusting for risks because you're not getting paid for readmissions. You're not getting paid for uh, so-called never events. So that's the whole idea of a bundle, uh, and it's a fair profit for efficient care. Now, what is cost effectiveness? And I'm, I'm sure there have been some uh, uh, papers there at this meeting that have talked about what, what cost effectiveness is. We have determined that our, our, our cost per quality adjusted life year has to fit in this certain threshold between fifty and $100,000, and that's really what the willingness to pay threshold is. This is a great article 
from the uh, from the Yellow Journal, which I really uh, uh, would uh, recommend a lot of our young surgeons read because this is really where we got to start getting involved. Um, um, you know, I actually gave uh, nurse surgery grand rounds at Calgary this morning. That's why I can't be with you guys. And I had a I had their entire nurse surgery, orthopedic, and anesthesia group in the room, probably about 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 80 or 90 people. And I asked them to raise their hands if they felt comfortable with health economics, and nobody raised their hands, right? So because this is a, a subject that's nascent in our medical school curriculum, it's it's it's, it's nascent in residency training. We've got to start to do this on our own, and, and there's, there's, good, there's some good basic articles that we read. Now, on the top of this, we've got this whole idea of the employer-led healthcare revolution. This article is one of the most read Harvard Business Review articles uh, in the last couple of years, uh, and, and a colleague of mine up here in Seattle, uh, he, he's really helped, he's an endocrinologist, but he's really interested in spine delivery um, on how health plans are going to have to start reimbursing providers on the basis of quality, and they're unwilling to pay for what they deem as unnecessary things. Now, um, if you go to Pike Place Market, you know what you're buying, you know the cost of it, and you know what it looks like, what it smells like, and what the quality is. However, when you're purchasing health care, at this point, both quality and price are still on the table. Then there's the idea of predictability, right, which is that the, 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 the lay press is writing about us in spine care, saying that we have this avalanche of unnecessary medical care and we're harming our patients physically and financially. This was a Gawande's New Yorker article where he specifically talked about spine care. So, so we, we've got to do a much better job for uh, the, the, the area of accountability, which is that the idea that, you know, for us deformity surgeons, we're doing these large surgeries with these massive complication rates that we're just going to get keep paying paid because the hospital contribution margin is associated with higher occurrences of surgical complications. Well, that's kind of a way of the past, uh, and that's not going to happen anymore. At the same time, we know that from an epidemiological standpoint, we're going to be inundated by patients with degenerative spinal problems and spinal deformities. So we've got to come up with a more sustainable algorithm to take care of these patients. Um, uh, there's lots of literature on the, fa on the, on the fact that, uh, that uh, um, non-operative management doesn't help a lot of these patients. And we know that uh, Centers of Excellence work is growing uh, uh, large, large numbers per quarter. So we've, we've used uh, a little bit of an improvement methodology uh, in our own system, um, and we've written a lot about this, um, of how we try to adopt standard work and how we made the standard work ubiquitous amongst the surgeons, whether they're neurosurgeons, whether they're orthopedic surgeons, um, our standards are, are all the same as to how we're going to surgery um, and how we are involving things like disciplinary conferences, how we're using two attending surgeons, even if we have fellows, yeah, how, we're, how we're reducing our complications by, by, by bringing up standard work. And we've also been looking at how you uh, use these conferences and, and, and other uh, uh, people in the, in the decision-making tree, particularly physiatrists and anesthesiologists, to come up with better recommendations for surgery uh, and then marketing this. And a lot of this is all around population health cost and value. And what we're seeing is if we take large populations and deliver uh, a more of a standardized approach to care, we're able to reduce all of these complications that we're seeing, particularly in scoliosis surgery, but even in routine spinal surgery by choosing patients better, optimizing weight, optimizing uh, smoking, optimizing mental health. Uh, and, and things like that. And where we're seeing the, the important improvement is in the first 30 days, uh, which is where we're getting a lot of our bang for our buck in the, in the, more, in the more difficult cases um, and, and, and saving a lot of money uh, for, for these payers. Now, you may think that this is a uniquely American problem, but it's not. Um, I uh, probably learned the most uh, recently on, on a trip over to the UK, uh, and I borrowed this slide from Ashley Cole, who's the lead spinal surgeon to, to the UK government. Um, uh, on this uh, spinal working group, and they've been cutting their budgets um, year by year for spine surgery, and it's the same issue, right? It's not cost effective. We have little standard work. We have perverse incentives. We've got private payers, governments that are fed up. Um, I think point number four is that we have to understand healthcare economics and delivery so that we can build better systems and we can work together in an unsiloed approach um, to, to have better uh, systems. So again, I think we crave standard work, and this is a, and I, is, is what's going to help us deal with the uh, the access issues. And we have to be able to develop these standards uh, so that we're all operating on the same patients using something like lean methodology uh, to help us figure out 
what our standard work is. Now, this hasn't changed very much. Many of you will recognize that this is the Dartmouth Atlas, and this was the utilization of spine surgery um, uh, back um, uh, in, the, in the early 90s. Well, guess what? The, it's been repeated, and there's still this dramatic variability all, all around the country. So we've got a, we've got a big nut to crack here, um, and, and that's really important. Now, part, part of this is going to be how you build a system around yourself as you're a young surgeon to make sure that you're mitigating risk, that you're involving your anesthesiologists pain doctors, uh, your physiatrists in, in, in the decision-making process. Part of that, we think, is getting everybody in the same room and discussing all of these patients. We've uh, had a large number of these now uh, from all uh, regions of the United States over the past seven years uh, in, in, in terms of getting team assessment of these patients. Now, quick example, here's a 71-year-old female who's, got, who's badly disabled with a high ODI. She's got a high ASA score. She's osteoporotic. Or Forteo was denied by an insurance company. This patient does not get surgery in our setup. Uh, we don't we don't try to go some, do some hail mary on this patient. We just don't operate on her, right? And and that's and that's because we can't optimize her bone um, health, and um, we think that this is going to be a cost ineffective surgery. Uh, again, uh, the standard scenario of many of you seeing patients like this: 14 previous spine operations, multiple non-unions. The patient's still smoking. She tells us that she stopped smoking. However, her urine coatening is positive on three occasions. When we map this patient, she needs this massive correction with two pedicle subtraction osteotomies and a big, big correction. We are not doing surgery on this patient until we ensure that she's optimized. And optimi optimization in this case is smoking. Here's another patient. Horrible films, uh, badly sagittally imbalanced, uh, uh, a severe fractional curve radiculopathy on a fentanyl patch, very depressed, anxious, catastrophizing, suicide attempts, nobody at home. Uh, in our neuropsychology eval, she gets a, a red, which means she's uh, you know, severely uh, challenged from a neuropsychological standpoint. This patient does not get surgery. This patient has to undergo significant optimization before um, we can go forward with surgery. And then maybe a year afterwards, we do something like this. So again, aggregating independent judgments of doctors outperforms the best doctor in a group, and that's really an important part of delivering quality and value in spinal disorders and complex spinal disorders. Now, for the last two minutes, I'll just tell you what I think the high value care of the future is gonna look like. And, and I think what this is gonna be is, is all around predictive analytics um, and being able to predict um, what you're doing and, and provide uh, a, a warranty or a guarantee, right? And this is gonna involve system-specific risk and bundles on something like this. Here's a 60-year-old female uh, who has a, a high BMI, who's anemic, who does not smoke, who's not hypertensive but diabetic. In our system, this patient's got a 92% probability of, of complications. This is a case we're not gonna bundle, this is a case we're not gonna warranty. And if this case comes in through one of these uh, centers of excellence payer groups, you may have to say no to this patient, right? If this patient is coming in a different channel with a different payment algorithm, you may be able to go forward and stomach the 92% risk of complications and do her five operations in six years to try to get her better. This is a, a, an, the opposite example of somebody who's gonna sail through, right, um, a, a major operation with a significantly lower risk of complications. This might be one you'd want to bundle or one that you'd want to give a, a guarantee for um, in some of these new pay, payment algorithms. So this is all around within your own systems. I have talked a lot about you have to be able to stratify risk within your own system. And we, we have generalized risk calculators. The problem is that's like a stew with 18 different types of meat in it and, and, and you have no idea what you're really eating. Uh, um, these, these system um, uh, specific risk calculators, I think, are going to be are very important in the future. So, in conclusion, uh, we got to standardize, increase patient safety. We have to use pathways, protocols, and dashboards. I think uh, high level medical center administrative support is necessary to make these changes. Uh, and for the young uh, uh, group in the room, um, all around payment reform and new payment models, it's all going to be around choosing patients better uh, and saying no much more than we can. We do. We've got to figure out who we can fix and fix them really well. Um, at the same time, uh, centers that do it better and standardize this care are already going to get increasingly rewarded. And my hope is that surgeons will lead the efforts. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thanks, Raj. Really appreciate you joining us, uh, Mr. Travels.